Meditation is a skill, it's something you work at, something you master. And as you approach it, it's a good idea to reflect back on what skills you've already mastered in life, to see what lessons, see what wisdom you already have that you've already picked up from those skills that you could apply to meditation. If your basic skill is strength training, there are a lot of parallels. The Buddha talks of the path as a path of strength. The strengths of the mind are conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. In fact, the Buddha has one way of formulating the path in these five terms. And he himself often compares the path of practice to various skills, and some of them have to do with strength. The skillful meditator is one who can control his mind as easily as a strong man can flex and extend his arm. When you need to crush your Distracting thoughts, you can crush them like a strong man crushes down a weaker man. And some of the analogies the Buddha gives, the similes he has, have to do with strength training. Back in those days, they didn't have strength training the way we do. But they did have archery, which was the basic strength training for noble warriors. The ability to master your concentration and to develop discernment, he compared to the ability to shoot your arrows great distances, to pierce large masses, and to shoot your arrows in rapid succession, all of which required strength. So as we're developing strength of mind, what, what skills can we pick up from strength and metal, excuse me, physical strength training? first one is to remember you're in this for the long haul. It's a long-term project here, and you have to watch out for quick fixes. That you're not going to develop strength overnight. So you can't believe those ads in the back of popular science that tell you just buy our cream and it'll melt all the fat off your stomach. It's the same with meditation. The idea is that you can simply just let go and there you are. There's nothing much to do. Just let go, let go, let go. It doesn't get you anywhere. There's work to be done. After all, the Buddha said, the Four Noble Truths have four duties. The first one is to comprehend suffering. You let go of the, the cause of suffering, but you've got to develop the path. That takes work. So if you're in it for the long haul, this means, one, that you try to set up a regular schedule that you meditate every day. You don't want to be a weekend warrior, because you know what happens to weekend warriors? They push themselves too hard. They're not in shape, and yet they want to get the results. They want to show that they're just as fit as everybody else, and then they harm themselves. This happens to people who don't meditate much in everyday life, and then they come on a retreat like this, and they push, 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 because they want to gain awakening in two weeks. You're going to be working in day-to-day -day increments. So develop the mindset that's willing to work in day-to-day -day increments. It's having a regular schedule, learning how to pace yourself, because you have to start where you are. You go down to the gym and seeing everybody else lift 300-pound weights. You can't lift the 300-pound weights. And you're not there to compete with them. You're there to strengthen yourself. So keep that in mind. Start out with what you can handle, and then push gradually from there. This means that you learn how, have to learn how to observe yourself as you practice, to see what works and see what doesn't work, to know when you're pushing yourself too hard and when you're not pushing yourself hard enough. Part of this means learning how to read your own pain. There's the pain that tells you that you're 
overexerting yourself, and then there's the pain that tells you that you're actually growing. And there are going to be difficulties in the meditation. Sometimes encountering the difficulties is an important part. When you have a bad meditation, don't say, well, today is a bad day. It's not going to work out. I should do something else. You never learn how to handle those states of mind unless you're willing to sit through them. So that kind of pain, that kind of hardship is useful. But when you're pushing yourself so hard that you find that you start hating the meditation, so you learn to sit through pain while you sit through pain every day, every day. After a while, the mind starts associating pain with meditation, and it's going to rebel. So you have to learn how to read that when you're pushing yourself too hard, when you're not, when the pain, though, is actually a sign of progress. And you have to learn how to vary your meditation. And John Lee has a good analogy of the good cook who knows enough not to fix the same thing every day. Sometimes sweet food, sometimes sour food, sometimes salty food. Otherwise, you're, the people you're cooking for get bored. This means in terms of the breath, learning how to vary the breath, learning how to experiment with it. Read the body. What does the body need right now? Does it need deep breathing? Does it need shallow breathing? Fast, slow? Do you want to focus on the in and out breath or more on that still breath energy that fills the body? Learn to read your needs and to vary your offerings. And expand your repertoire. That's another important point. Because remember, the Buddha taught lots of different meditation methods. In some cases, that was because different people would respond to different methods. But also, it's due to the fact that as meditators, we need different approaches. If you attack your defilements with only one weapon or only one tool, they're going to learn how to come from another angle. In other words, if the breath is your only topic of meditation, they're going to make it hard to get to the breath. Laziness will come in. Discouragement will come in. Boredom will come in. And you have to learn how to fight those off. And this is why the Buddha has other meditation techniques. Recollection of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. Four sublime attitudes. Recollection of death for when you're getting lazy. You don't know when death is going to come. We make plans in our life. We'll we have to make plans in life, but at the same time we have to realize that those plans could be blown out of the water in a matter of a few seconds. So the question is, are you ready to die right now, if it were to happen? That big earthquake that they keep forecasting, what if it hit now? And even though the solid was supposedly built to, to code, you never know. It could come crashing down. So when you find yourself lazy and disinclined to practice, remind yourself you may not have that much more opportunity to, to do it. So this is a good skill to have in your repertoire. What this means, basically, is you learn how to read your own practice, read your own progress, and develop different approaches to vary your offerings, to vary your training. not only through being sensitive to how things are going in your body, in your mind right now, but to continue the analogy, you should also read up on anatomy. If you're going to do exercises and want to start varying your exercise, you have to know exactly which muscles you're going to target and what, what they do to the body, what movements they control, so that you can start thinking of making those movements and strengthening those movements. It's the same with the mind. The mind has its anatomy the way it clings, the way it craves, the way it creates suffering. And it's good to understand how it comes about. So you want to read up, not simply for the sake of mastering theory for its own sake, but getting a sense of what the possibilities are, what the problems are, what the underlying structure of this problem of suffering is. Why do we suffer? The Buddha says it's because we cling to the five aggregates. Okay, learn about the aggregates. Learn about clinging.
But also remember, he teaches those aggregates. You learn how to use the aggregates as your path. So as John Lee says, be a person with two eyes. See that the problems in the mind, the factors that can create problems in the mind, can also be used to overcome the problem. You create feelings of ease with the breath. You perceive the breath energy as filling the body. You direct your thoughts and you evaluate the breath. That's fabrication. And you're aware of all this. So you take these five aggregates and you can turn them into the path. That's what you learn when you start reading the Buddha's teachings. It opens your awareness. It expands your horizons as to what's possible, where the problems are, but also what the potential solutions are. So it's not just going on your own sense of what, what's working and what's not. You want to tap into other people's wisdom. and learn how to integrate that into your own practice. Another lesson you pick up, of course, is that when you're developing strength, you don't want to just leave it there at the gym. Otherwise it simply becomes an exercise in vanity. You want to take that strength and put it to use so that you really benefit from it in your daily life, in other sports. Because in the course of putting to use in daily life, you begin to realize, okay, there's still some areas where you're weak and you need practice. And you begin to pinpoint exactly where those areas are. And so we're here to develop concentration and develop discernment, not just so that we can have nice experiences as we meditate, but we want to take these skills and use them in daily life. And that way you begin to understand where you need more work. And then there's the whole issue of food, how you feed. In terms of strength training, the question is what you're eating. In training the mind, the question is why you eat. Do you eat just for the taste? Do you eat just to play with the idea that you've eaten that fancy food or this fancy food. That's wrong feeding. You have to feed simply for the sake of keeping the body going, to keep it healthy, strong enough so you can practice. Eating enough so that you're not starving, but not so much that you over overfeed yourself. And so the practice isn't just what you do in the gym, it isn't just what you do in the meditation hall. It's how you approach your whole life, how you use the skills that you master in the meditation hall, on the cushion, in the course of your life. In this way, the, the training penetrates your whole life. And it becomes a training that's really worthwhile in and of itself. This is where the analogy breaks down. Strength training is good because it makes you strong enough to do other things. Not much is accomplished simply by lifting weights or running or whatever you do. Someone once said it would be good if they could take all those running machines and hook them up to generators. So that something would be accomplished. You take that strength and you want to apply it. You take the strength of com conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment, and you apply it to this issue of why the mind creates suffering, even though we all want happiness. But why do we keep doing things over and over again that create suffering for ourselves and other people? And the suffering isn't created only when you're sitting here on the cushion, it's created, created throughout life. So you want to catch yourself in the course, course of doing that and learn to bring the skills you've developed here in terms of concentration, discernment, mindfulness. And this is something you can do throughout life. This is another difference.
as John Lee said, that we live by strength of body and strength of mind. But when the chips are down, strength of mind can get along without strength of body if it's been developed. And strength of body is eventually going to leave us. No matter how well you look after your body, it's going to age, grow ill, and eventually die. But strength of mind doesn't have to go in that direction at all. It can take you all the way to the deathless. So this is why this is a training that's really worth devoting yourself to. Psychologists have studied the fact that people who develop skills tend to be happier than people who don't. But one thing I haven't seen them study yet is okay, which skills tend to lead to a more lasting happiness. And this is where the Buddha really showed his wisdom. Okay, it's focusing on the skill, st skills, the strengths of the mind. Those can see you through all kinds of difficulties. Strength of body can help you through certain difficulties, but it can only go so far. And as I said, it becomes a point where no matter how hard you exercise, it's just not going to get any stronger. And finally get to the point where you can't exercise at all. But the exercise of the mind is something you can take all the way to your final breath, and it'll carry you beyond. That's why if you have the time the opportunity to devote to this training. It's really time well spent. This is one of the few things in life that you can really give your whole life to, and it more than repays the effort you put in.